Well, it's great to be back in worship again, even though we're here and you're at home and watching us in your living rooms. But we just want to praise God that we get this opportunity as a team to come together and worship Him. I just want to share a thing with you that has been really relevant to us this week. And I want you to think about a potter's wheel. And they just throw a lump of clay on. And the clay is just clay. That's all it is. But it's when the person pushes his thumbs and pokes his fingers and dips in water and smooths things out that that lump of clay becomes something. But it takes somebody to make it into something. And then from there, when it's formed, it goes into a kiln and all of the fire burns away the dross and burns away the impurities that are in there. And when it comes out, it's glistening and it's gleaming. And I just want you to think about me and you as that lump of clay. Some of us, the clay might be dirty brown. And some of us, it might be pure white. Some of us, it might be discoloured. And it's got lumps and it's got impurities. But when we lay ourselves at the foot of the cross, as Jesus asks us to... And he uses his thumbs and his fingers and the water bowl and he takes us and he breaks us and he makes us and he moulds us. And when that's done, he uses us. And as we share worship with you this morning, the first song we're going to sing is The Potter's Hand. And it does talk about each one of us being broken, being moulded, being filled and then being used. And on from there, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts and ask him to dwell there and to cleanse us and to fill up that vessel that Jesus has created within each one of us. And then finishing out from that, we're going to sing a song called Springs of Living Water, which you may know to the tune of Ode to Joy, but it was written by Keith on the piano many years ago. And it talks about being in really dark places and tough places and sometimes horrible places but those of us who have been molded and broken and filled and used we're there for springs of living water to come forward and for Jesus to shine through us so I pray that you enjoy worship with us this morning so thank you to the team and let's praise God Gently 
Holy Spirit fall afresh on me. to our hearts. Lord, we just want to lay ourselves bare before you and just ask, Father, that you would take all those impurities and all that dirt and all that darkness from our hearts. Father, if I, if we, if any of us have caused somebody hurt through something we've said or we've done, then, Father, to bring that before the cross. I want each of us to bring it to the cross. Father, it's only when we can empty ourselves that we can come to you in our most desperate need. Lord, on our knees with our head in your lap and just ask, Father, that you would place your hands upon us and you would tell us that we are forgiven. Father, we seek your Holy Spirit to come to fill us for every member of our church, our community. We ask you to come. reading is from the book of John chapter 4 verse 14. The water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life.
our Bible reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 to 13. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with each other's tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speaking in their own language. And they were all amazed and marvelled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians, Medians, Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia, in Pontus and in Asia, in Pyrus and in Paphilia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya beyond Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mock, saying, These men are full of new wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, greetings. We're meant to be talking about Pentecost, but with everyone going off the platform then, it felt like the Exodus. <laughs> so, anyway, Pentecost. What is Pentecost? You know, it's a, a word you use. We, we often talk about the day of Pentecost. And it was a great day in the church. Though... We don't talk about it much. You know, we talk about Christmas, the birth of Jesus. We talk about Good Friday and how Jesus died on the cross and how crucial that is to, the, to our faith. We talk about Easter Sunday, the day of the resurrection. But we don't often talk about Pentecost, which was the day the church came alive. What does Pentecost mean? It's actually a Greek word uh, about 200 years before the time of Jesus. There was a a translation of the Bible done into the Greek language. It was called the Septuagint. And there are copies of it still available today. And, um, you know, it's just incredible when we look at some of these old ancient copies of manuscripts that are around and we see that what we have today in our hands is what they had back then. And and we know that we can trust this. This is an incredible book. Um, We could talk on that for ages, how accurately it is, how many copies of it we have from way back when and uh, just how well um, copied across. You know, this is virtually without mistake, yet you get uh, the writings of Aristotle, there's about a dozen copies of it and there's huge variations between the copies way outside anything we see in scripture. But here it is, the day of Pentecost 
And, and Pentecost is a Greek word. It means 50. 50 is significant in the kingdom of God. Uh, it is known as a jubilee, it is an, which means a resetting, uh, a, a replanting, a rebirth. Uh, every 50 years, people would be forgiven of their sins and things would go back to the way that they were meant to be. Didn't happen, though, um, because that meant you'd have to give people's, wipe out people's debts and we're run more by banks than we are by faith, so jubilees don't happen in real life, but they happen in the scripture. And so this is something of a jubilee event where God is doing a reset and... Uh, He's giving us his Holy Spirit. But it's more than that. It comes from a, a Hebrew feast uh, known as Shavuot, uh, which is the beginning of the harvest. Wow. Think about that. On this day of Pentecost, thousands of people were won to Christ. The church literally exploded as people were brought in on the first day of harvest. That is significant and that is the heart. But the, the, the account starts and this is really incredible. There are many miracles here on that day and if I'm allowed to be a little bit cynical, I think the very first miracle is recorded in the very first verse because three things we're told in that verse... We're told that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and that's, yeah, that sounds reasonable in that, but when we get into the original language, we discover what it's really saying is that the sun had just come up. Now, this is May 31 in Jerusalem. That means it's about 5.45 a.m., quarter to six in the morning. Now, I'm an early riser. But I'm not like everyone. There are a lot of people that sleep in. But notice this. At 5.45am on this Pentecost morning, the whole church was gathered in one place. Wow, that's a miracle for us today, isn't it? We couldn't even gather even though we want to. But here they were, 120 people gathered at quarter to six in the morning. Now, that's a miracle in itself. But it's an even greater miracle here. It says they were of one accord. They were of one mind. There was a common purpose, a common desire, a common heart. Oh, wow. No wonder this church exploded. And there they were in prayer, early in the Sunday morning, when suddenly, unexpectedly, unplanned. This was not something that they did. They didn't sit down and draft this out as part of their five-year plan, their 10-year plan. This was not part of their mission statement. It was not part of their, any of that sort of stuff that we love to do. They were simply doing what they were told, to gather, to pray and to wait. And they waited on the Lord and at the right moment, at that perfect moment, this 50th day, this beginning of harvest, when there were people devout Jewish people from all over the world. Oh, we so much do not understand the scriptures because we have a small-minded thinking about the world in which Jesus lived. I, I don't know, I think many of us think that it was just a little... Um, Desert country with a few palm trees and people riding between villages on camels. And this is the, the image we've got. And it is so wrong. You get places like Caesarea Philippi 
which is a magnificent city where they've got a, a, a stadium that's built that's multi-storey high, carved out of rocks that would seat 500 people. The engineering that went into these cities that were in that place at that time was incredible. This was a, a, a world that was probably only about 150 years behind us in technology. It was a world that was thriving and alive. And it was very much a cosmopolitan world. Years before, there'd been a, they call it a diaspora, a scattering of the people of Israel throughout the world. They had seen it as a judgment. And in some respects, it was a judgment. But it was also God preparing the world for the coming of his son. For every Jewish person that lived in Israel, there were five Jewish people that lived outside Israel. And they were people born in the far corners of the Roman Empire. I know we've all heard of Aladdin and you see that uh, funny looking purple creature they call a genie, right? And he's a magi. That's a load of bunk. You want to know who the magi were? They were the Jews who lived in Persia. They were the university professors. They were the public administrators. And they were called Magi. They understood and were part of a great kingdom. And they were Jewish people. And so when we see here that from the very far reaches of that known world, and he's only talking about the civilised world, not the, the complete world. You know, Judaism and Christianity went right out to places like Japan and Korea and India not long after this. Do you know that when Genghis Khan became that uh, barbarian ruler that the most prolific religion in his kingdom amongst the most prolific religions was Christianity and Judaism. We don't understand the world that it was. But God had got this world the way he wanted it. There were Jews there, devout men from every nation gathered in that place. Okay, suddenly, unexpectedly, God breaks in. And he breaks in in a way that they would know and identify that it was God. That he came as the sound of rushing wind. And they knew that was God. Earlier, when Jesus had been speaking to Nicodemus about three years earlier and he described being born again, he said, the wind blows where it will. No one can describe it, though they hear the sound of it. Here we hear the blowing of the wind, suddenly, unexpectedly, rushing, filling, completing. And God fills the house. And that is a secret of Pentecost. If you are going to have a Pentecost faith, God must fill the house. But we have a compartmentalised idea of life. We'll put God on a Sunday morning. We, we don't want him Monday at work. We don't want him Tuesday night when we're going out with our friends. We don't want him on Saturday when we're going to the football. We'll have God in that little cupboard called Sunday. But God does not fit into cupboards. He does not live in cupboards. He fills the house or he's not in the house at all. God fills the house. We don't put him on a shelf. We don't treat him like a Bible. You know, yeah, I got a Bible there. It's up on my shelf. I can get it down. Hang on. Let me brush the dust off. We don't put God on a shelf. 
God fills the house and he appears to them as fire. But here we have a difference. The theme of fire started first, well, actually it was all the way through. But we find it coming to the fore with Moses. As a shepherd where he goes out and he sees a bush and he thinks that's strange. The bush is on fire but it's not burning, it's not being consumed. And if you've been in arid places in the outback, you get one of these little spinifex type bushes and you throw a match in and, a, and it's gone. It burns in seconds and just drops to the ground as ash. It's dry, it's spindly, there's nothing to it. Woof, it's gone. But not this. Here is a fire filling this bush, but it's not burning. And it's got Moses' attention. And he realises that he is seeing something that he had never seen before. Don't see that every day. Mm, certainly don't. And he is told it is holy ground because God is there appearing as a fire. Later on in the book of Exodus, as God leads the people of Israel out, he goes before them by day as a pillar of smoke, and at night as a pillar of fire. And I wonder about that. You know, how do you explain that? How, do you, how would you go if you were from a foreign nation and you saw this great exodus of people walking across a desert, no food, no drink, and yet they're being fed, yet they're being watered, and going before them in this desert region, not just little puffs of bushes burning in front of them, but a mighty pillar of smoke by day and a mighty pillar of fire by night. Oh, that had to be God. It had to be God. And so the fire comes. But now because the curtain in the temple was torn and God is no longer separated from us, because God now makes his dwelling place upon us. No longer do we have God as a pillar of fire, but he spreads out and he fills the hearts and lives of 120 men and no doubt many women. Who knows how many people he filled that day. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And straight away, they start talking in other languages. So the people from Persia could listen to these Galileans speaking and they're saying, we are understanding you. No longer are really you going, yeah, 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 and we can see your mouth moving, we can hear noise coming out, but we haven't got a clue what you're saying. We know what you're saying. How often is it when we travel and we go in amongst other people. We have trouble talking to them. They have trouble listening to us. And we motion and we, we try and say words and we point and do all sorts of things to try and make simple conversation. Uh, I want a drink of water. Ah, 50 cents. And it's a hard work conversation when you're in a foreign land unless they speak English. Oh, it's great when you speak English as your first language and you go overseas. But imagine how terrible it would be if you didn't have English and you were travelling. It would be impossible. But here they heard in their own languages. Now that is an incredible thing. That is a miracle. And that is a miracle of blessing because God took the curse of the Tower of Babel that is mentioned back in Genesis 10 and 11 where God divided the nations and separated them by their languages as a judgment, as a curse upon humanity because they were wanting to cling together instead of filling the world. 
And they were being manipulated and abused. And so he separated them. He shattered the people with language. But now, when the Holy Spirit fills us, the barriers of language and culture and nationality are no longer relevant. For we are no longer citizens of our nations, but we are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of the glorious city. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Where our ancestors come from is irrelevant when the gospel comes to light. But the greatest miracle that day was the message. Oh, pretty soon a crowd gathered. I'm sure the neighbours heard this roar. They saw what was going on. They went and got their friends and this report of that day spread out through all Jerusalem. And pretty soon there's a crowd gathering around to see this strange thing. What is going on? By now it's 9am in the morning. And they're saying, ah, they're drunk. Don't worry about it. And then Peter gets up and he proclaims the message of the church. And the message of the church, first of all, is it's not about us. The church is not about me. It is not about you. It is about Jesus. When they come to him and say, what is up with your men? He turns, he doesn't answer that question. He says, no, that's rubbish. It's nine in the morning. Get over it. Here is the real issue. It is Jesus. When Christians get together, how often do we talk about Jesus? Boy, this was a move of the Holy Spirit because I've been in many churches and you get Christians together and they will talk about football, they will talk about holidays, they will talk about family, they will talk about work, they will talk about maybe politics, but you've got to be careful with that one. They will talk about all sorts of things. And over in the corner will be a couple of oddballs who want to talk about God, but they're just a bit weird. We'll leave them alone. But here, on this day of Pentecost, they were proclaiming the praises of God. A church, 120 people. What's on their lips? The name of Jesus. That is a real miracle, I tell you. And I praise God. Because I believe the day will come. We will see that again. The message that Peter preached that day is the message of the church. He pointed to Jesus, a man approved of God by his divine works. He showed them, he said, you saw Jesus, you walked with Jesus, you heard him preach, you saw him do those miracles, you saw him heal the blind man, you saw him heal the lame man. This same Jesus was approved by God because of the things he did. There is no denying it, no denying it. He was a worker of miracles. And what did you do? You crucified him. You condemned him to death. You stood by and cheered as he was nailed to a cross. But God raised him from the dead. This same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. That is is the message of the church. And I want to tell you that Jesus is the same yesterday and forever. 
But has the church woken up to the fact that he is the same today? Does the church understand that we too have seen the testimony, have available to us the knowledge of this same Jesus? We know what he did. We know what he is capable of. And yet, like those men of Jerusalem, we are as guilty of sending him to the cross as any of them. For he died for our sins. It was our sin that took him to the cross. It was our iniquities that were laid upon him. And when we chose sin over righteousness, when we chose our own heart over him, we crucified Jesus. We were there when they nailed him to that tree. But God has raised him up and God has given him a name that is above every other name. And the message that Peter gave the listeners that day is the message we need to hear today. What shall we do, they said, for they realised their mistake. And Peter turned to them and he said, Repent. Turn around. Return to God. However you want to understand that, that is the message of Pentecost. Repent. 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 But we live in a world where we justify and we make excuses and we pretend that we are righteous. But we have all sinned and fallen short of that glory of God. And the message is repent, return to the cross, turn back. I am sorry, I am a sinner. I am undeserving. Let us return to the God of our creation. And be baptised. Be baptised. Now a lot of people will make that out to be about water. And water is a good way of showing that you belong to Jesus and I believe in baptism. And if you want to be baptised in water, I, I will love to be bap there baptising you in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. You want to bring your children in? I'm not going to have an issue with that too. I will baptise them. I'm not big. I, I love baptism, but I'm not big on making an issue of baptism. Because when I see that word baptism, I see something so much more than water. It comes from a Greek word, baptismo. It means to take something and you put it in there and you leave it in there and it stays in there. And when I read that, I know it's got to be more than getting someone and putting them in a tank full of water because I can't leave them there and I can't make them stay there because that is not really good. It's got to mean something else. And I see that that day the Holy Spirit came and baptised. It entered into, it permeated, it filled up and it remained in 120 believers at the beginning. And by the end of the day, 
There were thousands that the Holy Spirit had filled and remained in. And when they were baptised and the Spirit filled them, they were also baptised into Jesus, into the body of Christ, into the church. They were his in him. Pentecost is about God. Filling his people with his spirit and the people filling the body of Christ. Which we call the church and that's an unfortunate name because when we say church you think about buildings like this or you think about denominations like we have on the sign out the front or you think about... No. Church is the accumulation of God's people who believed in Jesus Christ and bowed their knees and received the Holy Spirit and were forgiven of their sins at the cross and born again. Whether they lived in the first century in Persia or whether they live in the 21st century in Petrie, it doesn't matter when or where you live, if you belong to Jesus, you are part of his body, you are part of his church. The day of Pentecost is God doing a wonderful thing in the life of his church. I believe we need a fresh Pentecost, a fresh gathering of God's people saying, fill us, Lord. Fill our whole houses. Fill our whole lives. We don't want to be Sunday morning Christians and Saturday afternoon football fans. We don't want to be Sunday morning Christians and Thursday night party goers. We don't want to be Sunday morning Christians and midweek heathens. Fill our whole life. Fill our whole house. Fill our whole purpose with you. What goes into our hearts is what comes out. And what is in a person's heart will be reflected in their conversation. Oh, for a church that would talk about Jesus. Oh, for a church that would be filled with the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. That when people gathered and they held their cups of coffee, they would want to talk about nothing else but the praises of God. God, ah, the Lord has blessed me this week. Ah, the Lord has laid on my heart this week. Ah, the Lord is good. Ah, I long for that to be the conversation of Christians. But first, it has to be the reality of the church. We need a fresh Pentecost. We need a fresh spirit. We need a fresh commitment to Jesus. I want to tell you, his commitment to us has never changed. It's always been his all on that cross. It's not Jesus that's missing from this equation. It's our hearts. Will you join with me afresh? I want to invite you today to call afresh on Jesus. Father in heaven, our houses, our hearts have been filled with many things as we have chased the follies of our age. And our mind has been on many things. And seldom was Jesus 
any of that. Oh Lord, we've sung your praises on a Sunday morning and then gone out and spoken the praises of sporting gods, sung the praises of manufacturing gods, sung the praises of entertaining gods. Lord, banish such speech from our hearts. Banish such speech from our hearts. Fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit so that we are flowing over with Jesus to the point where there is no room for the gods of this age. Fill us afresh. Fill us anew. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit in a fresh way this day upon your church. Let your people be filled to the point where they have no choice but to declare the mighty works of God with whomever they meet. Let your word, the living water, flow out from us. Make us, mould us anew, fill us, refine us. We are here, Lord. But this has to be of you. We cannot fill our own hearts with your spirit. We can only open our hands and invite you to do that. Lord, this morning, we invite you to be Lord of our life anew. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven as of a rush of mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Go forth with the filling, the presence and the glory of God. Go forth proclaiming the praises of God, filled with the Spirit of God, looking to the Son of God, our Lord and Saviour, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.